Hi, welcome. Welcome back and thank you for continuing this journey with me. I'm delighted that you are here for these few moments of reflection, of introspection, consideration and meditation. The intensity of our world currently seems to increase each week. And with it, I suspect, our own anxiety and concern also increases. We are simultaneously weary and hyperactive, tuning out and relentlessly tuning in again. We are by turns fearful and daring, despondent and hopeful, dejected and inspired. This roller coaster of emotions, expectations, hopes, and disappointments is confusing. It is dis disorienting, destabilizing, and exhausting, which is why it is time to breathe. You may be interested or even relieved to know that today is Rosh Chodesh Cheshvan. It is the first day of the month of Cheshvan, which is significant because it is the only month in the Jewish calendar in which there are no holidays to observe or celebrate. After two months of either counting down or being in the midst of the High Holy Days and the festival of Sukkot that follows, we're in a kind of regular schedule as it were, Although truth be told, in Jewish tradition, there is no such thing as a regular schedule. For clergy, however, this is a time of relief, regrouping, reorganizing, and returning to the basics, which is the rhythm of our weeks, punctuated every seven days by Shabbat and the ongoing cycle of reading the Torah as we acknowledged last time, as we have just begun at the beginning of the Torah again. Just days ago, I had the privilege of hearing a beautiful teaching about this week's portion, which is the story of Noah. And I would love to share it with you because I think it is relevant. It is from one of the great Hasidic masters of the 19th century, the Polish rabbi, Yehuda Leib Altar of Ger, and it comes from his collection of sermons, reflections, and instructions known as Svat Emet. In answer to the question, to what might Shabbat observance be compared? He answers, the Holy Sabbath is like Noah's Ark. The Holy Sabbath is like Noah's Ark. Let us consider this for a moment. In the, I'm sorry, in the story of Noah, as it is told in our Torah, the storm is raging all around. The world is falling apart. Almost all living things are dying, but there is one safe haven in the world, and that is the ark. It is keeping its inhabitants safe protected and alive. It is doing this not by taking them out of the storm, but by providing refuge in the middle of the cataclysm. In the Sfat Emet's teaching, that's what Shabbat is supposed to be, a lifeboat in the midst of our busy, overwhelming, intense and consuming weeks. We are all familiar with the way in which we become so caught up in doing, planning, organizing, that our attention and our energy is hijacked by our daily concerns and preoccupations. Shabbat is supposed to be our refuge, our retreat, our protection. Shabbat provides the spaciousness for us to find refuge in God's presence, or if you prefer, in nature, or spirit, or whatever source might speak to you. As Abraham Joshua Heschel described, Shabbat is a sanctuary in time, and we are given the privilege to enter into it. 
it seems to me that we are all yearning for such a sanctuary, a sanctuary for our spirits, a place of repose and of refuge. It is from this point of view that I believe we might see the arc of this week's Torah portion as instructive, as symbolic, as inspiration for finding our own arcs of safety and of shelter. How might we do this? Gathering as we do each week for these moments of breathing and temporary retreat from the world is certainly one way. But if, you're fi if you find yourself wanting to go into your ark every day for a brief time, here are some possible steps you might take. You can always find your meditative posture and just breathe as we do here together. But if that is easier said than done, you might find the Sfat Emet's guidance helpful. He suggests that we relax into the root of our vitality, the root of our vitality. In other words, even in the late 19th century, people were consumed with the business of their everyday lives, working, shopping, feeding themselves and their families, wondering what the next challenge or problem or difficulty might be and running around frantically to fix it or prevent it or minimize it. Our harried, distracted, anxiety-filled lives are nothing new. His suggestion is that we relinquish our sense of control and surrender ourselves to something greater, larger, and more expansive than we are. He had no illusions that such a state of mind might last, but he understood that even a few moments of recognition that we are not the ultimate arbiters of our existence can be a mini vacation, a retreat, a haven of ease and of calm. God or nature or the spirit of the universe or the source of life is the place that our tradition suggests we turn when we are in need, when our own strength seems limited, when our own resources feel diminished. Our tradition has always taught us that we are part of something greater, something beyond ourselves and yet within each of us. There is great comfort in that, both the acknowledgement that we are not in control of so much upon which we depend. We are not the architects of all that keeps us alive. Our power is finite and reserved for a relatively small amount of our activity. And we are part of a vast universe that mysteriously has structure and meaning and a reality that precedes us and will be here long after we are gone. Let us relax into that knowledge, our Hasidic rabbi tells us. Let us let go for a few precious moments and let the universe be in charge. Let us stop, excuse me, let us step out of our weekday minds. Let us notice all that keeps us alive without our doing anything. And let us submit to the root of our vitality, to the source of our being, and find refuge there. In other words, let us create a brief Shabbat for our minds and spirits. Let us enter an arc of safety and repose, even as we are buffeted by the waves without, the waves that will be there when we emerge from our temporary shelter. It is a way of giving up even briefly the need to do, to fix, to mold, to influence the world around us. We need to have a bit of humility in order to do so. We need to admit that the world will continue for a few minutes without us. We need to know that it will all be there when we return. We don't have to wait for Shabbat itself. We don't have to have permission we can enter into our own Ark of Shabbat. We can carve out an inner Shabbat of refuge anytime by doing 
three things. Switching out of our weekday minds. Becoming aware of our vitality, of all that means we are alive and relaxing the sense that we are in charge, that we are the doer. Let me do that one more time. We can switch out of our weekday mind, become aware of our vitality, of all that means we are alive and relaxing the sense that we are in charge, that we are the doer. So, let us find our meditative position. As we have said, we want to be at ease, but attentive. Feet on the floor, with a certain erectness to our posture, our hands unoccupied. I have been thinking that when I suggest we be attentive, that we might allow tension in our bodies to be present that would be better to let go. We want to be present, but relaxed. We want to be receptive to this experience, but in order to do so, we must relinquish our grip, our holding, our holding on tightly and allow our bodies to feel released, unwound, free. We might do an inventory and go through from the inside where the tension might still be lurking. Where might we be able to release it? In our necks, <laughs> always. In our backs, in our hands, our legs, our feet. I know that sometimes I find myself almost holding on for dear life with every muscle in my body. Let us see if we can release those holdings. We can take them up again. We can always take them up again. We are much too practiced to let go indefinitely. Let us look inward for a moment. We might go from our heads and relax even the muscles in our faces, our necks, our shoulders. Oh, always a place to hold on. Our chests, our tummies. As a population, we have a lot of tummy ailments, I think. Perhaps we can let go of whatever we are holding on to there in the pit of our stomachs, as we say. That is a physical place. We let go and continue the journey through our hips, our thighs, our calves, our feet. We can wiggle our toes and feel them down there doing their work, which they pretty much do. unnoticed, thanklessly, let us breathe in. Fully, deeply, restoratively, believingly, 
let us fill our bodies with this breath, this miraculous breath. that enters and leaves, even when we are not paying any attention. We count on it. We depend on it. Let us breathe in and breathe out again. If we breathe in a, a fullness, let us breathe out some of that tension. If we breathe in healing, let us try to breathe out all that hurts. If we breathe in comfort, let us breathe out our worries. Like the thoughts that might intrude, let us just notice them and let them go. We don't need to fight them. Just notice. Of course you're there. You are a constant companion. But for right now, you may be quiet. Let us breathe in an imaginary space or a space that we can picture very easily in our mind's eye. It might be right where we are sitting at this moment. It might be a beautiful lake or a mountain path. or something in our neighborhood that allows us just to be, to be present, that feels safe, removed, that could be for these few moments our arc of shelter. Let us breathe in a sense of that safety, of that embrace the belief that we are held, even the feeling that we are held in that arc of our imagination, in this universe, that at this moment, does not feel random or uncaring. Every day in our liturgy, 
we read a prayer. Either Ahava Rabba, with great love, you love us, Adonai, or Ahava Tolam, with an everlasting love, you love us, Adonai. Either way, we believe that we are loved by an unending love. that fills the universe and makes none of us anonymous. It is not an easy concept. I struggle with it. I love the idea. I love the sense that whatever else may be, we are held. Our tradition would say we are held in an ark of God's love. That may be a bit much for our rational minds, but sometimes, sometimes, we might just access that believing part of us. And feel supported by something we will never understand. For now, Let us breathe in a sense of safety, of security, of being sheltered by a receptacle that protects us. from the waves of all that transpires in this world. The waves keep coming. Even as they retreat, they come in again. But we have the power to go into our inner arcs and retreat for a few moments from the chaos that swirls around us. Let us breathe in this gift, this gift of our vitality. And breathe out again.
in a continuum. that sustains us from moment to moment. It is interesting to me that the Hebrew word for ark, teva, is used only one other time in the whole of the Torah when Moses is placed in a small teva, the basket of pitch and bitumen that his mother creates to save him and sets him also adrift on water. In both instances, the ark protects and it saves the lives of its inhabitants so that they might emerge and continue the work of creation. But when we emerge, we are better equipped, having allowed our souls and spirits the safe haven of retreat. By way of conclusion and a prayer for the week ahead, I turn to John O'Donohue in a poem he entitled, For One Who Is Exhausted. (laughs) You have traveled too fast over false ground. Now your soul has come to take you back. Take refuge in your senses. Open up to all the small miracles you rushed through. Become inclined to watch the way of rain when it falls slow and free. Imitate the habit of twilight, taking time to open the well of color that fostered the brightness of day. Draw alongside the silence of stone until its calmness can claim you. Be excessively gentle with yourself. I wish you a week of being able to retreat to your inner arc whenever you feel that would be helpful, supportive, sustaining. And may you be excessively gentle with yourself. God bless. See you next time.